Today's webinar is webinar number three of a series. Webinars one and two are still available for download via YouTube, or you can contact us at Helen Sons and Associates, and we'll be happy to send them out to you. Go along by typing them into the, screen, the question box that you should be able to see on your screen. The webinar will be recorded and it will be made available. I will also be creating a list of useful references and resources which I'll be posting on Facebook, Twitter and via email later this week. This webinar is about valuing and supporting families. In this webinar, we will be exploring approaches to supporting the families and carers of people living with dementia. To do so, we will begin by exploring our own concepts of family and how these can impact on the support we give, or not, to families and family carers. We will then think about the limitations that paid carers may face in gaining and holding information about the people they support, and how alliances with family carers are essential if we're to uphold the well-being of the person living with dementia. And finally, we will look at how person-centered thinking tools and circles of support can be used to build and strengthen those alliances. As well as some challenges to our thinking, I hope we can have some fun along the way. So, what does family mean to us? We all can come from very different geographic, socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds that bring with them multi-layered and dynamic images of what family might mean. Our past and our ancestry influences our perception of family, and our own experiences shape the experiences we create, or strive to create, for the next generation. Our own experiences, the highs and the lows, and our own expectations of family can directly influence how we perceive the family units of those we may support living with dementia. There are times when I hear staff saying in exasperated tones that their job would be so much easier if it weren't for families. It may not be said out loud, and it may not be said all the time, but there can exist a perception that some families are almost akin to the monsters, detached, maybe feared, maybe even seen as a source of amusement, but always separated from community by their difference. At times, such families can appear eccentric and appear to be interfering by bringing their own customs and rituals to bear upon services, seem to be disrupting paid staff in their efforts to support the person. But however they sin, this same group of alienated individuals are expected to act as if they're the Waltons. Warm, forgiving, ever charitable, eager to help, ever able to adapt and accommodate. This juxtaposition may sound extreme, but it's one that I see played out time and time again across so many different care settings. And a great deal of conflict can occur when the expectations of families and friends clashes with those of the paid care workers. The imbalance of expectation creates cycles of conflict as it demands of alienated families to become ever more at odds with the expectations of paid carers. This breakdown in communication can so often result in disconnected support for the person leaving them isolated within their own community and, and creates a greater risk that they may be isolated or separated from their families and carer networks. The Prime Minister's challenge on dementia, which comes to an end in a few days at the end of the month, brought to the fore the concepts of people living with dementia living well, with support for them and their families in dementia-friendly communities. Set in motion by the National Dementia Strategy and the Prime Minister's Challenge, the Dementia Action Alliance developed outcomes, aspirational statements that, through co-production, all people living with dementia should be able to say. One of those aspirational outcome statements is for all people to be able to say, I have a sense of belonging and of being a valued part of family, community and civic life. We have come a long way, and my last webinar, focusing on the rights and barriers to the rights and citizenship of people living with dementia explored this, but we need to keep moving if we're to achieve the outcomes that we've all been set. As part of their annual survey, the Alzheimer's Society asked 1,000 people living with dementia 
about their experiences of living well. The results, published in Dementia 2014, Opportunity for Change, shows that 58% of people felt that they did indeed live well. And that's great. But it means that 42% do not. A significant 61% said that they felt anxious or depressed recently. And of those people who were looked after by a carer, 43% said their carers received no formal support or guidance. Towards the end of last year, the Care Quality Commission published its findings from a thematic inspection into dementia care. Titled Cracks in the Pathway, the report identified that in 33% of cases and a substantial 68% of, of care homes and a substantial 61% of hospitals they visited, support was classed as either variable or poor in relation to decision making and choice. The result of this poor care is that in those settings, people with dementia or their family carers are not involved in decisions about their care or choices about how they spend their time. Yes, we have come a long way, but our outcome remains an aspiration for many if, at a fundamental level and in the most important of circumstances, we are failing to talk to people. And crucially, we appear to be failing to listen to and act upon their hopes and their needs. Participation in civic life and the theme of developing dementia-friendly communities is kept in focus through the Dementia Promise. Published this year by the Alzheimer's Society, this manifesto sets out what the charity sees as the key initiatives to be taken up by the next government, whatever its colour. The manifesto draws on the findings of another key society report, Dementia UK, the second edition. This report provides the updated statistics relating to the experience of people living with dementia in the UK. It estimates there are 850,000 people living with dementia in the UK today, with 42,320 of those living with a condition under the age of 65. The report estimates that dementia costs the UK economy over £26 billion a year, which is a staggering figure, with two-thirds of that cost being borne by people living with dementia, their families and carers. Every year those same carers, usually spouses or adult children, provides an additional 1.3 billion hours of care for people, saving the state a further 11.6 billion pounds. The development of dementia-friendly communities has to extend to every aspect of community. So, health and social care services need to think about how they can create dementia-friendly environments. The Dementia Promise outlines 12 actions that the Alzheimer's Society hopes the next government will adopt to improve the lives of people living with dementia. In relation to the development of dementia-friendly communities, these also include a commitment for all health and care settings to be dementia-friendly, ensuring that all service providers and care workers in dementia care have protected dementia training time, and that the new government must demonstrate leadership in creating a dementia-friendly society by committing to all national and local government employees becoming dementia friends, which is nice, but being friendly isn't enough. As I've already said, there are 42,325 people today who are under the age of 65 living with dementia. Many of those will be of working age and in paid employment, supporting families, paying mortgages, contributing to society in their own way through taxes and national insurance payments. So we have, if we have to have a dementia-friendly society, we need to think not just about how settings and services are set up to support people living with dementia, but how those services and all services are adapting to support their own staff who may be living with dementia, or perhaps supporting a partner who does. My challenge today is for you to go back to your own human resources team or the policy team. Check out what your organisation is putting in place to support one of your colleagues who may be diagnosed with living with, as living with dementia? What, or what is in place to support the carers should they need to adapt their work patterns or roles to maintain their support for a loved one? So we've outlined some issues. Let's outline some solutions. Personalisation. And the person-centred thinking that underpins that personalisation agenda gives us very practical and very successful tools that, when used correctly and consistently, can make the aspiration of dementia-friendly communities a reality. By creating dementia-friendly communities, we can create a cohesive and extensive support network for carers, a network so extensive and pervasive as to be woven into the fabric of society, not standing apart from it. 
By supporting carers and the networks that surround them, we can hope to maintain the connection with civic life essential for people to live well. But many of the people living with dementia that I know and work with argue that they don't actually want a dementia-friendly community. What they want are communities that are friendly for all. Take, for example, a town planning system that understands and incorporates the needs of people living with dementia as it plans the new shopping and housing complex. By addressing those needs, for example, avoiding dead ends in walkways, using creative lighting and ensuring clear and unambiguous signage, they will create a community that is safer for all of us. That community must have people and relationships at its core. So, if we're going to develop sustainable community, we need to start with understanding, creating and nurturing sustainable relationships. Let's start by re-examining that relationship between family members and paid staff. Rather than seeing each group as alien, a mutual respect of difference may be beneficial. For example, we need to recognise that family carers and paid carers bring very different forms of expertise to the table. The family carer's knowledge and experience are specific to the person they care for, whilst paid staff have general information about the condition. What we need then is a framework for practice that brings these two sets of unique knowledge together to co-produce a specific support plan for that person. One that identifies how the condition impacts on the specific needs of the person and how knowledge of the person can help support innovative solutions to the challenges that the condition may create. Throughout, however, we must never lose sight of the person as their own expert, and the ideal relationship is one where all views are heard, but that the person remains at the centre and is involved in all decision making. Even when a family member holds lasting powers of attorney for care and welfare, their input must not go against the best interest of the person. This can be seen as challenging at times for some services if they see the family's desires as at odds with the knowledge of their, their knowledge of the person's wishes. It takes courage, but also humility here to be able to address those concerns without causing offence or further alienation. The connections are too valuable, but that relationship must not be at the sacrifice of the person's rights or dignity. In a recent blog, Helen Smith, who is a community connector with Community Circles, spoke about the discussions in social media and in the news about loneliness raising concerns about the significant impact that loneliness can have on a person's well-being. Indeed, the campaign to end loneliness calculated that the impact of loneliness on life expectancy is startlingly equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. In their report, they further state that 17% of older people are in contact with family, friends or neighbours less than once a week, and that two-fifths of all older adults, that's almost 4 million people, say that the television is their main company. The lack of, a, of quality of a person's connections is as damaging as the lack of quality of those, persons, of those connections. But what, it is, but what is it, whether it's intimate connections who the person sees once a week or looser connections they see every day, it's the, the maintenance of connection that matters, the strengthening of those connections. In a recent article in the Journal of Dementia Care, McAdam and Savage discussed how community circles of support can really help people living with dementia to increase or maintain contact with personal and community network. Circles are very powerful, and I suggest you read Helen Sanderson's Facebook and blog posts by Michelle and Helen from Helen Sanderson's Associates to see how they have been using them to make a real and sustained difference for the lives of people living with dementia. One page profiles, and importantly, the meetings held to generate them, are the groundwork to developing community circles. The first meeting to develop the one-page profile can offer a template for how future circle meetings should be held. The development of each person's one-page profile is key then to the personalisation of services and therefore to the maintenance of the person's relationships and networks. This development should not be an interview process, but should mirror the principles of reciprocity. Then it's about how the richness of information gained and shared is utilised. The meetings always start with a round of appreciation. After everyone present has introduced themselves, attendees address the person who is the focus of the meeting directly and say what they appreciate about the person. This direct, genuine feedback has profound emotional significance. I can recall in one meeting a daughter sitting very stiffly by her mum, 
and saying directly to me, I never know what to talk about. She just doesn't answer me. She said that as her mum's dementia developed, she'd found visits and time together a greater and greater strain. But in preparation for the meeting, I'd asked her to come prepared to share something that she appreciated about her mum. So, she looked at her mum and she told her how she'd appreciated all that she did for her as a child. As she began to talk, she relaxed. She began to talk about the fun that she and her sister would have at home, the constant supply of fresh baking, the delight of licking the spoon, and the surprise at almost every mealtime as they came home from school, because mum would invite anybody from the neighbourhood who, in her mind, needed a jolly good feed. As she talked, her mum reached out to take her hand, and for the first time for ages, she said her name. Afterwards, we talked about how, even though mum might not answer, she was always present, and she may always be listening. Before we can work to sustain relationships, we need first to identify those relationships and the networks they might sit within. This is part of my relationship circle, and you may remember I shared it in my last webinar. I'm not good enough at graphics, as we all know, to be able to display all of my friends as significant connections. But you can see the idea here. Those that are closest to me in the centre are, 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 are my, my closest friends. Those less so, further out. It may be helpful, if you haven't done so already, to draw your own. Fill it in. Who's in your life? Who makes you complete? Then cover up the most significant people in your life. How would you feel to be without them? My interests revolve around my horse and helping out at the yard where she lives. But I don't go to the yard on my days off and every evening after work just to see the horse. I go for the sense of belonging and acceptance that I feel with the people who work there. Think about your own interests. Is that true for you? That, that you may have begun to attend a group because of the interest, but you continue going because of the people and the friendships you've created. Let's visualise the relationship circle of the people you support living with dementia. The first thing to think about is the layout of that circle and what sections have been included. Have you included the work section? Why not? Remember those 42,000 people who may be working of working age. What about hobbies? Is that the same thing as structured activity? Probably not, but if you have listened to the person's hopes and dreams, it should be. For people living with dementia, they may also have another section titled Paid Support. People who are paid to provide support either to them or for them. OK, so once you've drawn the map, what about how we populate it? Think about the people you support. How densely is their circle populated? As dense as ours? As we age, we lose some density of connection. But it's not the number, but the strength of those connections that matters. For some people living with dementia, the connections that remain are with paid staff only. What about staff as friends? Hmm. How might it feel to have to pay for your friendship? For people with a paucity of connections, sustaining existing friendships and neighbourhood connections, or having the opportunity to develop new ones, can literally make the difference between life and death. This powerful image is part of the campaign from Age UK fighting against the loneliness that many older people experience in the UK today. It's stark, but all true image reminds us of the urgency with which we need to work to take care of the precious connections that people hold, and gives impetus to our helping to create every opportunity for new ones. A sudden change of well-being, perhaps, resulting in the need for service support services, can alter the dynamics of people's existing connections. Both sudden and insidious changes can result in carers experiencing a roller coaster of emotions. These strong and unbidden emotions can cause us to act in ways that others may perceive as challenging or threatening, but they should be seen as neither. They should be seen rather as a way of expressing the chaos, the fear or the rage that is happening inside us. The family member who is making their third complaint that week about the laundry may not be really talking about the laundry. They may be but there is a strong chance that this may be their only way of expressing their inner fears and emotions. Imagine accepting others into the intimate life of you and your loved one. Many carers express exasperation that they are criticised for doing their best, and of course we understand that concern. But the criticism needs to be seen for what it is. If the laundry is poor, sort it out. If you know the laundry is good, then step back and think about what this person might be saying. Kubler-Ross's grief cycle helps us to think about what family members may be experiencing as their loved one is diagnosed and then lives with dementia. 
Initial denial may be expressed through shock or avoidance of a subject and unwillingness to talk or to engage. Let's use our laundry example. They may just simply take the laundry home without confrontation or comment. Anger may be expressed through frustration and comments such as, how many times do I have to tell you, either spoken out loud or whispered behind backs. Depression may be appear as hostility, with battle lines very firmly drawn. And here we're back to the images of the monsters. But as people start to move through their grief, they may reach the bargaining stage. And it's here that family carers will be able to begin to share their stories, their hopes and their dreams and their fears. And it's here we must be at our most attentive. This is when we can come together to develop one page profiles. Co-production, fabulous as it is, may not work when parties are experiencing anger or depression. Finally, we move through to acceptance, where support planning can begin with families being able to relax and explore new options of support. There are lots of ways that we can support people to navigate through their sense of loss. One way is for people to continue to provide as much support as they feel they can, and for this to be welcomed. But a word of warning, not every family member wants to be involved, and no one should feel obliged to continue in a role that they may find distressing. No person should be made to feel guilty about being involved or not, or feeling unable to be. Person-centred thinking then helps families to talk about their concerns and fears by sharing, for example, what's working, what's not working during a one-page profile meeting. I met Raymond and his daughter Val when I facilitated the meeting to create Raymond's one-page profile. Raymond had been living at the setting for a few months, but for all of that time, staff had simply been unable to support him to have a bar. It was only Val who could persuade him to do so when she visited. She said that this placed a strain on their relationship as Val explained, because she felt that she could not enjoy their time together as she felt obliged on every visit to help him to wash and change his clothes. She felt able to talk about this during the one-page profile meeting when I asked her what didn't work. Similarly, the staff members who attended also agreed that bathing Raymond was something that didn't work for them. Val said that simply maybe because they were singing the wrong songs. It was simply that simple. Raymond would love to sing as he washed and changed. Val had discovered this early on and always sang and danced along with him. Staff now sing and dance. Raymond relishes the sing-along in the bar and Val's visits now consist of time spent chatting and laughing. After the meeting, she shared with me that the stress of having to deliver that personal care was becoming so overwhelming that she'd con considered not visiting at all. But it was only her concern for his well-being that kept her coming. Like Val, Many family carers may feel overwhelmed about the role and responsibility of caring. Open and honest discussions, using the tools, working and not working, perhaps also thinking about what makes a good day, what makes a bad day, can help to both uncover concerns and help us to share solutions. Relationship connections can also be influenced by the environment, physical and social, that surround the person. It helps to question if the environment and the culture is relationship-centred or job-centred. This picture shows a typical residential care home bedroom. It's certainly very bright and very functional. But is it homely? Settings can be personalised with photographs, decorations, cushions and drapes. And of course the furniture can be changed. But does the layout always strengthen relationship connections or threaten them? What about that bed? In many health and social care settings, the bed is seen as a place for sleep or for supine care delivery. Is that how you use your bed at home? Is it a place for sleeping or supine treatment? Or is it, is it a place of quiet contemplation? Or of noisy and raucous fun? Meet Margaret. She's the mother of a close friend of mine. Margaret has always had a natural affinity with animals. In her youth, you can see here, she was an amazing horsewoman and a champion at Jim Carners throughout Kent. She rode in point to points at Aldington and Charing, and having married, moved to live in India, where she jockeyed at flat racing and steeplechasing. The family have always had cats and dogs, and Margaret has always been known as a bit of an animal whisperer and rescuer, grasping spiders, etc., and letting them loose. At one point, she became a veterinary assistant to a famous vet that operated on racehorses. On one occasion in India at the stables, she approached a stallion well known for his aggression, but he nuzzled her shoulder and she eventually jockeyed him on a race, and of course they won. His name was Diamond Gold. 
In this picture, we can see the young Margaret at another Gymkhana. Look closely. You might be able to see that she's wearing a shoe rather than a riding boot. Well, you think. She couldn't get the shoe on. She couldn't get the boot on, rather, because she'd broken her ankle on a fall earlier in the ride. But she got straight back on and rode the horse Pickles to a win. This is Margaret now. In November last year, Margaret had a stroke. And she's pictured here in bed with Bunty, an adorable, boisterous, 70-pound bulldog, prone to knocking everybody and everything asunder. However, with Margaret, she's as gentle as a lamb and very protective though on one occasion she did eat Margaret's dentures. They are, as the picture shows, mutually adoring and the absolute best of friends. Margaret may have been physically diminished by old age, but her spirit is still strong and ever so rebellious. Bunty recognises that, that in her daft, dumb, bulldog way. She often has Bunty's 12-pound head laying in a lap, but Bunty's irreverent too. They're two peas in a pod. Family isn't always people. And beds are not always for sleeping in. But what about the size of the bed? How hard might it be for someone who has, been live, who has lived in a loving and intimate relationship to suddenly sleep alone? What provision do we make to support the intimacy of relationships? Can people fall asleep being cuddled? If they have no one but paid staff in their network, how do we support that person to feel held and safe? Who cuddles them to sleep? What bureaucracy is put in place to protect us from human contact? Of course, we need to keep people safe, but being safe should, shouldn't mean isolation, and it can never mean loneliness or, or fear. How might your life be? How might you maintain relationships and connections at a physical distance, perhaps perpetuated by bedrails, gloves and aprons? And that attention to detail needs to extend across all settings. Are there sofas in tucked away cosy corners for people to snuggle in? Is the dining room space flexible enough so that families can drop in and eat and share together? Where do the children go and play when they visit? But communication and the maintenance of relationships is not just about our doing two people live in dementia, for that goes against the fundamental principles of reciprocity and co-production. Connection is also about living in the public eye and in creating civic life that lends weight and new dimension to a person's hopes and dreams and their sense of self. Meet Keith. I'd like to consider Keith a friend of mine. Alongside his work with the Forget-Me-Nots group, Keith has become very active in the Alzheimer's Society User Involvement Programme, which supports people living with dementia in influencing their work and wider health and social care policy. As an ex-headmaster, he uses his knowledge and experience with children and literacy to assist the Society's Dementia Knowledge Centre in reviewing books for children and parents. He is also involved with the User Involvement National Advisory Group, helping to develop and deliver training for Society staff and volunteers. I have the privilege to work with Keith to deliver training to a wide range of health and social care staff on many occasions. His candour, his humour and his intelligence never cease to amaze me. Talking about his dementia and sharing his vast knowledge helps Keith to retain his sense of self, a sense of self that upholds his citizenship. He says that at the time of his diagnosis, when he and his wife Rosemary were physically reeling from the shock, he recalls saying to her that although one door may be closing, another will open. He has a lifetime of knowledge and opportunity and experience to share. He himself says that he can only continue to do so because of the love and support of his wife Rosemary. And as his condition changes, he knows that he's going to rely on her more and more. So at both the national and a local level, Keith and many others living with dementia actively influence policy and are directly involved in training to improve care experiences for people living with dementia and their carers. So what about training and understanding for the families and family carers of people living with dementia? We have focused in this webinar on relationships, and a necessary component of any relationship is equality. How equal is our approach to family support? Within the actions of the Alzheimer's Disease Dementia Promise is a call to ensure that all service providers and care workers in dementia care have protected dementia training time, without a doubt an admirable call to action, and it's going to be one that I obviously support, provided that means more than one afternoon every three years. We've already seen that every year carers, and we've said spouses and adult children, provide 1.3 billion hours of care 
saving the state £11.6 billion. But how much information do carers receive? There are some excellent services available. We've also heard in the Alzheimer's support that a significant number of carers have no support at all. With only the specific knowledge about the person and no general knowledge about the condition, carers may struggle to sustain their individualised support that the person needs. Many family carers will provide support for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks of the year. If we are to enter into and sustain honest relationships with families and family carers, we need to develop shared experiences. And one way to do this is through shared learning. The Alzheimer's Society, Dementia UK, Age UK and national and local carer support groups are very active in offering this support. But what about when the family member can no longer manage? or is absent and the person receives formal support. How much shared learning takes place in, in formal health and social care settings? I've worked as a trainer and facilitator for many, many years, and I can probably count on one hand, maybe one and a half, the number of times that family carers have been an active participant part of the learning, the learning group. If we want to develop genuine relationships, we need to be transparent in all that we do. I do know of services that employ service users to peer review their service delivery. I know of others that support carers and family members to be involved in the internal quality assurance process, for example, using dementia care mapping as a tool to evaluate the experience of people living with dementia in that setting. But these are isolated experiences. How does your service involve the person and their family carers? Do you share training with the staff? Are they involved as consumers in the role in quality assurance? If not, how can you create the opportunities for this to happen? If your immediate reaction thought is to say, well, that possibly can't happen, we can't do that, ask yourself what drives that reaction. What do we have to hide? We're not the experts. We have the general knowledge. We need to share that with the people who do have the expert-specific knowledge about the person. Our statistics have also told us that over 42,000 people live with dementia under the age of 65. For many of them, it could be a younger generation, perhaps their young children or grandchildren who provide their support. If we're to make society truly dementia friendly, we need to future-proof civil awareness by sharing understanding with our children. Truly dementia friendly support ensures that inclusion and humanity are intrinsic within all school curriculums and that information about specific conditions is also made easily available. The Alzheimer's Society is actively supporting over 140 school projects aimed at raising awareness in schools and in using that knowledge to forge links and build relationships in the wider community. Those relationships have resulted in shared learning projects with children, perhaps through new IT items such as Skype or iPads for live story work, or through shared dance and theatre production, poetry and reading classes, shared art classes and many, many more ideas that break down barriers and create community networks. The Dementia Diaries are one such initiative developed in Kent. They are stories gathered from young carers who support a member of their family with dementia. The stories are funny and poignant in a way that only a child could write. Here we see part of Fred's notebook, he hates the idea of diaries, as he talks about the fun he has with Gramps. In another part of his notebook, Fred talks about how Gramps always seems to have too many layers of clothes on. And to come to terms with the dementia, what Fred now does is he joins in. He puts on as many layers as he can too. The diaries have been used to develop the, uh, the brain cell boogie. This is a short clip available on YouTube that helps explain dementia to younger children. And the link to it will be on my resource list. But talking of children, I have two beautiful girls. Incidentally, they love the dementia diaries. But I I want to finish by offering a word of caution about listening and sharing. I ask you to think about how much sensitive information we hold as paid carers. The secret shared at three in the morning when someone wakes from a bad dream. Or the repressed and hidden memories that come to the fore as someone loses the control over what memories they share and which they keep locked away. One of the hardest but most important parts of relational care is the development of trust. With that comes the moral duty to protect the stories of the people we support. We talk about holding in communication. That means that the conversations we have away from the person is held in the same respectful tone as though the person were present. 
I believe that shared learning is a way to develop open and honest relationships to create that trust with the people we support and their families and carers. Over time, I've kept some of my personal stories, my secret fears, hidden from my daughters. If I develop dementia and I receive formal support, I wonder how many of my secrets will be told. Just because we have information doesn't give us the automatic right to share it. Okay, we've come to the end of the um, formal presentation of the webinar. What I'd like to do now, we have a number of people who have come and are present. I'd like to ask those attendees who can a question. The question is, how do you involve family carers in the delivery of the support that you, you provide? You can type your answers into the boxes and we, we can have a discussion about what goes on. The good practice and let's share it. What about how you use um, knowledge in quality assurance? Is anybody um, that involves people living with dementia or their families in their quality assurance cycles, how do you do that? What might the barriers be? They want to answer your questions. Okay, that's fine. Um, people aren't answer, asking questions on the um, on the screen, so what I'll do is my email and my Twitter account are available on the screen. If you want to ask questions in a, in, in a more private way, please do so. Come back to me, talk about how you involve people. Think about the barriers. What are the common issues that we might face in trying to engage people in in helping us to help them? Thank you for taking your time out to listen to me today and I look forward to hearing from you soon.